Our next speaker, Caspar de Kyle, uh, is an extraordinary uh, uh, creature, uh, a mutant again. Um, uh, welcome to the stage. <laughs> and a few words just by way of uh, introduction. So strategist with the Youth Climate uh, Coalition, a World Economic Forum uh, global shaper, also uh, one of the troublemakers on the um, a road tour on, on, on the future of tax and so on. The floor is yours. We very much look forward to what you have to say, but particularly a, a younger perspective. Thank you, John. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Casper Terkal, and I hope to share with you kind of two short, um, let me just, there we go. Uh, the story of how young people are experiencing systemic breakdown and how I see young people leading systemic breakthrough. Now, I uh, get my, as I like to see it, unusual rather than funny name from two Dutch parents who moved here in the 80s. Uh, my dad had just completed his uh, MBA in America, started off as a young investment banker. My mum had joined him there as a spouse and wasn't allowed to work, but uh, following a life of breaking the rules, decided to set up a small uh, floristry business by keeping the flowers in their bath overnight. And I think the entrepreneurial spirit that we heard about earlier on has definitely uh, been set in my family. Um, the... Uh, as a kind of three-year-old, I loved cars. I no longer do, but I knew every single car and make and model in the whole of Clapham. This, by the way, is a 1988 VW Fox Coupe. It was my favorite. Um, but as a three-year-old, my favorite phrase, rather than cars, was, that's not fair. And I think just about every toddler probably has that as their favorite phrase. But as my loving parents added one younger sister and then another and then another, that phrase just became all too common. Um, and I'm afraid I haven't, haven't really lost that phrase. Um, I ended up at boarding school uh, as a 13-year-old in a testosterone-fueled teenage surrounded uh, boys' boarding house. And coming to terms with the fact that I was gay made me feel pretty afraid, alone, um, didn't really know what to do about it. Uh, and that didn't feel very fair either. Um, luckily enough, I figured out actually I have a wonderfully supportive, loving family. I have friends who stand up for me. And uh, there was something called the internet which told me exactly what I needed to do. Uh, but so so that, that problem was solved. But really that experience of kind of being marginalized, being pushed to the point where you feel powerless, where you feel afraid has really stuck with me. So when I see it elsewhere, um, it's something that really just hits my heart straight away. So by the time I got to university, I was an activist. Um, I thought, well, if I could do something about the situation that I was in, hopefully I can do something about environmental destruction or global poverty or whatever else it is that I see in the headlines. And in 2008, uh, I went to the Arctic with WWF. They took a small group of young people from around the world um, that's us down in the bottom. Now, ironically, as I said, I have Dutch parents, and Emma, who is to my right, is German-Cambodian. So I think a modern representation of the United Kingdom. But we spent 10 days on a boat going around Svalbard, meeting research scientists, seeing for ourselves the retreating glaciers. Um, we also went swimming, which I think, if, if there's any evidence that's needed for a, uh, for a warming Arctic, that is certainly it. Um, it was no more than a dip, I can promise you. But um, it was the first time that I really understood the complexity of climate change. I'm a history grad, so science was also always something I was a little bit afraid of. But understanding how feedbacks loop, feedback loops work, understanding how um, we really live in interconnected biosphere, how two thirds of Holland is actually under seawater, all of these things started to come home and we kind of left with an energy of a pack of huskies and decided, right, well, okay, we're just gonna bring together all the young people around the UK and set up a youth climate coalition, uh, naive that we were. Um, we thought we would take young people's voices to the center of where we saw power to be at the United Nations. And we spent months preparing. Uh, we learned about every negotiation track, about every subgroup of every draft text. Um, and you know, we ended up, this by the way is me being terrified by permafrost. Um, uh, we learned just about everything that we could about this UN system and how we could influence it. We met with negotiators, we met with ministers and chief scientists and tried to get into the press and um, spoke at General Assembly. This is Guppy and Marcy both looking sleepy, but I promise they were hard at work um, and Josh speaking. But we felt a most enormous lack of impact. 
we weren't able to really do anything. Uh, at one point, and some of them are in the room, we, there was a group of 16 of us sitting on the floor somewhere in the convention center, really seriously saying, maybe, maybe we need to bomb the convention center for us to have some sort of impact. Now, it ended up just being a banner drop, but um, nonetheless, it, uh, it shows what happens when, when you push uh, young people to the margins. When I graduated, I started to work for a small communications agency that worked with large corporate clients on sustainability. And to my surprise, there were people inside these big corporations who felt the same frustration that I did about the lack of impact that they were having on climate change. And it then followed after two years working in the NGO world, the same thing is happening there. And now I see that also in the civil service. And I think we need to accept that our kind of collective failure on issues like climate change, that impotence is not because of any personal failings. It's because we've reached the limit of the ideas of the current paradigm that we're in. We know an era has been ended when its basic illusions have been exhausted. Because many fundamental beliefs and uh, practices that we have no longer serve us or the wider world. And as we've heard this morning, it's not about just putting new actors, young people into the UN system, for example, that it will improve its performance. It's actually redesigning the system that needs to happen. We know it's short-termist, we know it's um, mechanical, as someone said earlier, we know it's anthropocentric, and we live under this dictatorship of the profit motive. And it just so happens that my prism to getting to this point was through understanding climate change, but for many young people around the world, it's other things. So whether it's you know, public service cuts or whether it's democracy or whether it's corruption or whether it's unemployment or education, these movements, as Pamela was talking about, are all around the world and uh, all really coming to a fold. Um, what they have in common is that they see the interconnected nature of these problems. It, they're no longer asking for just, you know, government to take this one action. They're seeing the systemic nature of these problems. So young people, in many ways, could be society's weakest link. We are not yet uh, in the ranks of adulthood. Uh, as a 25-year-old, I feel that I'm now shifting to that, uh, especially with friends getting married and babies arriving. But um, we're also no longer in the cocoon of childhood. We're kind of in this liminal space. And we can be uh, an unbridled and dangerous uh, power when we're marginalized and ghettoized. This used to be carpet right, uh, the riots of last year. But I think we can also be society's strongest link. Um, we have the, the kind of, we're empowered and endowed with the most energy perhaps. We are vigorously ambitious. We are technologically savvy, all of the usual things. But we also have the greatest capacity for challenging the status quo. We're, no, we're not so associated with the standard way of thinking. And we can be an explosively liberating force. So what now? What now for young people? What do we, how do we see it? And again, this is just my perspective, but I think that as previous generations who try to shift previous systems that needed shifting, we're learning. We're learning how to be that liberating force. And the first thing we're learning is that as much as we'd like it, nobody has the answers. There is nobody coming to rescue us. Um, there is no map. There is no case study to take us through. Um, we really only have each other. When the forms of an old culture are dying, the new culture is created by a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. So without a map, we need a compass. And really, values are what can be our compass. My current work is looking at the impact of social psychological research on uh, how values behave, how they change, and what that means for campaign strategy. And what we know is that to build a democratic and just and sustainable world, we need to really reframe that compass. Um, we're innovating, and we're going to hear so many of the ideas later on today that I, I, I won't spend time talking about all the different things, but young people leading efforts in green jobs, on future generation rights, on closed-loop waste solutions, it's happening all over the place. But we're also learning, and this is really hard as a campaigner, uh, where you spend most of your time talking about how other people need to change, that if we want a paradigm shift out there, it needs to start in here. And that's a daily, a daily practice, step by step. We've also learned the hard way that this is going to take a fight. It's going to take a fight between those who cannot imagine changing the rules and between those who have said, I'm sorry, we already have. We've created the world anew. So 
As much as young people are leading around the world and you know, I can promise that we will always be courageous and inspiring and have ideas, we will look towards the elders, I guess, that's you in many ways, for capital, for encouragement, for wisdom. And so I think, actually that'd be interesting. Who's under the age of 25? Could you briefly stand up if you're here? This is a moment for courage. I know there's at least one person. Yay. Okay, so everyone who's sitting down, if you could maybe make an effort to speak to one of these people during the rest of today. They won't all agree with me, but they'll have something interesting for you to say, thank you, and, to, uh, and for you to hear. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day, and um, thank you. Brilliant.